The 1930s saw drag racing in its infancy. The deserts and dry lake basins around Southern California were a hotbed of thrills and spills as young men set their hearts and guts on beating the next guy and breaking records. A young man's hot rod was not just a form of self-expression, it also provided the means for a social life and some stability. Drag racing, which started as an underground pastime on the streets, rapidly grew in popularity by the early 50s. With faster and faster cars coming off production lines, Organized races were regularly held on abandoned military runways, dry lake beds, and timed by handheld stopwatches. The 1960s brought a wave of capital into the fledgling sport, resulting in dedicated drag racing arenas, arenas seating thousands with sophisticated electronic timing systems, dozens of individual car classes, coast-to-coast -coast TV coverage, and huge money purses at the major events. It wasn't just the public that was hooked. Auto manufacturers were taking note too, and for young men who found themselves in the right place at the right time, this was an era of unprecedented opportunity in automotive history. Herb Canvas was one such man. Earning his mark early on as Mr. Four Speed, he lived a life full of the inevitable ups and downs that come with the drive to succeed. This documentary is a story about Herb Canvas, and it seeks to capture all that he's accomplished as a drag racing legend and a respected businessman. Today, Herb is retired, but he doesn't do nothing very well. He's extremely active and has a keen understanding of the value of long-term relationships and the importance of helping others. Built me an 80 by 80 building down behind the house so I'd have a shop to work in because I knew I was going to be doing something. I wasn't going to sit around and do nothing because I don't do nothing very well. I got to be busy. And I carried a bunch of stuff home from the shop, out of the machine shop, out of the rear end shop, and it took me a pretty good while to get all that organized and settled up and fix me a set up there where I could do whatever I wanted to do. Following a day of shooting for this documentary, Herb and his sons organized an impromptu racing round table with Herb, Buddy Martin, Dave Christie, Chick Danino, and Jeff Stunker. Giving them an opportunity to reminisce about all their adventures. <laughs> What was your what was your day like as the manager of, of Sox and Martin? You'd probably be better off asking my wife. Because <laughs> <laughs> she said I never came home. <laughs> well, the big thing was is, you know, you always having to uh, make contact with the sponsors and keep them happy. You've got to get the parts that need from Chrysler or whomever from wherever. And at the same time, booking the races, the match races, and uh, all the other things that went with it, and uh, it was a, it was a pretty, pretty good day. What Just was keeping it? us out of trouble was a big part of the day, <laughs> too. It? He came out in the shop one day, I was building a 72 car, I just got these titanium hood pins from Trick Titanium. Reed just built them for me, made them for me. Buddy picked them up and looked at them, he said, wow, those titanium, where'd you get those? I said, I got them from Regis at Trick Titanium. How much were they? I said, I don't know, I charge them to you. <laughs> that was his average day. <laughs> he never knew what we were going to do. I but did I'll say later. One, you knew later. <laughs> <laughs> he come out one day and said, check on getting a, we just got a new truck. He said, uh, check about getting the air conditioner, because they didn't put factory air on their trucks. He said, about getting the air conditioner on the truck. And so the next day or so he came by and said, you check on air conditioner, getting the air conditioner put on that truck? I said, oh yeah, it's on there. He said. How much was it? I don't know, I charged it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but Buddy never said a word about stuff like that. He would, he would go, mm, <laughs> and turn off, walk off. <laughs> but I pulled one on him one day. We had to go to 
Washington, D.C. I had never told this story. We had to go to Washington, D.C. to uh, get these pictures made. And we all had to have these certain kind of pants and Oh, for the USRT off. deal? Yeah, I didn't have nothing like that. So I asked Tom Richardson, I said, what do I need to do to get something? Like he said, well, buddy's got a count up in this current hay, I think. Was that the yeah. name of it? <laughs> so I went and forgot me a coat and a tie and a pair of pants. And Tom said later, he said, buddy came in with his ticket in my office and said, what's this charge at, at the current hay for a sport coat and a spare slacks or something? And, and uh, Tom said, you told Herbie you had to have one, didn't you? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, now, car. now, you know, Chrysler built some fairly crazy stuff in the early 60s, and then they went to the 67 cars. You had the clinic. The 67 GTX and the 67 ROW car, were, they gave them the same curb weight. That was the same NHRA weight for the two of them. So let's talk about how much fun that was to drive with a four-speed. Oh, they were like driving a street car. I mean, those things were big 3,700-pound tanks is what they were. But they were the first slick-shifted four-speeds they ever made and assembled in a production deal because they those cars came with a slick-shifted four-speed on them. Who did, who did the modifications for the four-speed? Was no that idea. done at Chrysler? Chrysler oh, had yeah. that done? I'm they sure were it was. Provided that way? Parts came from Chrysler. All yeah. Now they just had the gears made with every other clutching tooth missing and then had the sliders broached where every other tooth was missing. We used to have to do it by hand. Oh, yeah. Grind I have ground them many way. of those. Yeah. And in 68, they built some pro-shifted transmissions, like the lugs that were welded on later with the two teeth missing out of the slider. Right. Right. Well, Chrysler built about five of those transmissions. I know Ronnie had one. I had one. Strickler had one. They were... They were there were about five of those transmissions is all it was. Like they did it in 65. We had those goofy things from England in 65, but uh, they worked. But uh, I've actually still got the part of the pinion gear on mine. I ran it all year long in that 68 car right there. Never took it out of the car all year. And finally it rolled the cluster gear off low gear. And every tooth on the transmission looked like it had tooth decay because it had so many runs on the thing. We'd run it so much. Wow. Wow. Herb's sons have all found success in their own right. These apples haven't fallen far from the tree. In the early 2000s, Herb's son Michael started collecting his dad's race cars together with some dramatic forward look Chryslers. Aside from the race cars, this 59 DeSoto was one of Mike's favorites. He houses the collection in his museum in Burlington, which is where most of this documentary's interview footage was shot on a custom built set. I love the cars, especially uh, from 57 to 61 in that era, 62, where they had fins. And these cars can be really made into really nice cars. And the biggest thing people screw up in them is the wiring. Any of the cars that Michael has bought for the museum here and stuff, uh, most of them wind up going through my place because they won't half run or they're messed up. And anything that leaves there, when it leaves there, you can get in it and go wherever you want to with it. And go he does. Herb almost never flies anywhere, especially if it's a car show or auction event. People treat me really good at these events, and I couldn't do as much as I do without what Michael has done with this museum and the cars. And We are back in Harrisburg, and the first of three consecutive Sox and Martin drag racing cars has arrived. Herb McCann was really one of the most respected pro stock drivers, super stock drivers back in the day. Yeah, the car that he drove to the AHRA championship, GT1 championship back in 1970. This is the car. Yep. 390 is the bid. And So much drama, so much excitement with this Todd Warner collection. And we had a little bit, a little while ago here, Herb McCandless, who you've met, and his son, Mike. Mike, what did you do today? Uh, well, you know, I've been at the AACA library all week uh, doing research on some of Dad's old cars. And I have all of his cars from 65 to 72. This car, though, he drove. He won multiple times in the car. And uh, I didn't tell him, but I was sitting here hiding out, waiting till at the very end, and snuck in a few bids, and very fortunate to come home with the car. What a nice son you have. He's the best. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. I knew nothing. I was standing up there, and I looked down and saw the bid. Well, 
father and son day here with Tamika Mox, and congratulations. Nice job. Bro. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. I'm very proud of my boys, all three of them, all five of my grandboys. Just like he did with Herb Jr., Herb is passing the torch to his grandsons, Jonathan and Jason. They're good boys. They help me all the time. They work with me all the time. They've been raised down there in my building with me since they were big enough. I've got pictures of, of Jonathan standing on a stool that's about three foot tall, putting the carrier in the rear end, tightening the caps up on it. And I'm very proud of that because they're very well-mannered, very good young boys. And we go to these shows and <laughs> just have a ball. No, this isn't the one that jumped over the Toyota. Like father, like son, and now grandsons, they all got bit by the racing bug. Herb Jr. guided them through the Junior Dragster program, and they were very successful with it. They won a lot. Well, they got aged out of that, so they wanted to put them a bracket car together. They only ran it four or five times, and the last race they ran with it was at Piedmont. It was a $20,000 to win bracket race, and whatever it was, they wound up getting the runner-up. They got beat on the final, but uh, they won $8,000 in one weekend with this bracket car that probably got a, a fourth of that tied up in it. Donald Brown. Curry, North Carolina, beautiful 69 Nova. Now then, 620 against Jason Candless at 779. Double O1 to not a double O1. And Candless will be your winner. Maybe with a four on the 79. One light. Don, dead on with a one for Donald, but he's a little late let go. Dallas Cherry and Jason McCandless. Dallas dialed in 781, 583 for Dallas. Trip zip to 19. McCandless gets the win. 19 dead two. Cherry couldn't get there. I got three other grand boys, but they live in Raleigh. Of course, they're all grown now. They're you know they're in their 20s and grown up and going fast. Blake is known as Mr. F4 Speed on virtual racing platforms such as eRacer and iRacing. He's also a commentator. Come. Oh, what a huge run on the outside. Three wide and a three. Here comes Derek Justice looking for the race lead. Shot out of a cannon with Briar LeBrad. Malik Ray goes up top. It's Justice with the lead out of four. I'll tell you what, Keegan Leahy is using every lane on this racetrack to try and make moves, although Bolin bouncing off the apron. He's somehow able to collect it. Look at how close that 32-23-11 machine gets to Graham Bolin as they were working off the corner. And that, that is the one thing about this race, James. These drivers are testing the limits, getting right up to their doors. Keegan Leahy showing he's going to keep the track position. He has been in every single lane in the last lap. And Leahy trying to control this race. It's awfully hard to do when each lane has been as competitive as it is. Blake, Blake is a great guy. Um, works with, uh, I race with him on I, I race in a little bit. Blake is part of the broadcast. He's one of the, he's a pit road reporter for, <laughs> for this. It's really cool. <laughs> So uh, he does a great job. Um, and one of our network partners ought to look into Blake McCandless as a pit reporter someday. Let him do a truck race or something. Anyways, uh, thanks for all the questions. Thanks. And most recently, he's landed the position of crew chief and spotter for eNASCAR Cup Series driver James Davison. Jonathan and Jason spent a lot of time helping their granddad and uncle on the road at car events across the country. And sometimes it puts them in the front row for one of Michael's surprises. Well, here it is, the 1970 Sox and Martin postdoc duster that Herb McCandless drove for them. I was commissioned to resurrect this car, and we spent a lot of time hunting down and uh, documenting what would be all the correct pieces that would go on this car. 
So here it is. It's uh, ready to go to Carlisle. And uh, back to Mike McCandless, who is going to surprise his dad with it. Well, we're back at Carlisle again. Now, I don't know how many years I've been coming up here, somewhere between 15 and 20. This is the biggest Mopar show of the year. I love it. We had 2,500 cars here last year. I don't know, I'll talk to a couple thousand people in the next three or four days without any trouble. What made you fall in love with Chrysler versus Ford? I was running a Chevrolet, 1964. That was the 11 package. And I used to go to the drag strip on Saturday night and I would beat up on the car. We'll have to tell this story. What is going on? I don't know. What's, my, uh, what's Michael doing? That's the next question. That's a clone of my 70 car that I want Indy with. Well, I figured since the real one didn't exist, the uh, best thing we could do is get you a uh, identical twin to it. So. That's great. That come great. here, come here, take a look. look. Get in. I might get the fever. <laughs> Turn to 7,000, let go of the clutch. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> this is the car that that changed my whole life. Yeah, it really did. Biggest yeah. race in history, first ever U.S. Nationals. Yep. So now yep. this is all the cars. I gave away the race at York. I red lighted in this car to Landy and needed my behind kick for that. I had that one. Mm -hmm. I went to Indy a month later and won it. Left there and went down rolling and won it. Well, I decided about a year ago that uh, we needed to have this in the collection. And like I said, since the real one didn't exist, I figured we need to get uh, as close to a real one as we could. So here we are. Yeah, this is the car that, uh, the, a clone of the car that changed my life. How did it feel to sit in there for the first time? First time you said Need a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into the Sox and Martin shop in May. This was sitting there with my name on the door. And I went and ran Jenkins that weekend in a match race, and I got paid to do that. And I mean good money too. And that's, that's just where the whole thing started. Buddy hired me and he said, get in, this is yours. And that smile must have been hard to wipe off your face. If I'd have died, it took on to take her two weeks to bury me. You couldn't have got a smile off my face. But you know, the Sox and Martin team was the number one team in the country by far. And Buddy could have hired anybody. Anybody would have took the job. You'd been a fool not to. And he called me and asked me if I wanted to drive. Stamp, stamp of approval. Wow. Wow. And the blue engine, that was a Jake King trademark. 
He painted all of his engines blue. What do you think of your boys that go way out of their way to do something like this? Nobody's got kids like I got. Nobody. Nobody's got a family like I've got. That's one of the most important things. If you don't have family, you got nothing. And I got the best. I've got the best by far. And all the people around me. It's not just, I mean, people have been so good to me my whole life. And the only thing I could do was shift gears. A surprise like this is a great way to get the Chrysler National started. But for real car enthusiasts, it's a place to catch up with your friends and see what's new. Oh, I knew I would finally run into a real car guy out here. What's hey, up, Chris, Chris, how you doing? Good to sir? see you, man. Good to see you. Oh. This is a clone of the 1970 car that when I came to work for Sox and Martin that I drove. The real car was destroyed in a towing accident. It burnt to the ground, car and truck and everything. But these were stock cars. I mean, the pro stock cars now, they don't even resemble a right. car. No. Stock is in quotes. I mean, this thing came off the showroom as a six-cylinder car. Yeah. And it has a bolt-in Lakewood roll bar. If we'd have wrecked, we'd have been dead. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't have worked. Just no. there to, uh, so the rules would be satisfied. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah, that, that's right. what the whole thing was. I mean, it had stock disc brakes. We didn't have any lightweight brakes. Yeah. We made our own lightweight brakes in 71. That's amazing. Elmer made the spindles, and we got the rotors cut out and put the Earhart calipers on them, because there was nothing. You didn't pick the phone up and buy anything back then. Right. You pretty well had to make whatever you did. We made the aluminum mounts to what we call the elephant ears and mounted it, and it had a 18 spline Chrysler four speed in it. You know, back then we were cutting every other tooth off the gears and what they call a slick shift. Yeah. And that's what we ran for a transmission back then. We didn't even have the plenum manifolds in. These were the IR manifolds before the YN did. The, there was no manifold for a Hemi to put two fours on. Right. At that time, other than the stock street Hemi thing and a cross ramp. And so we built these IR manifolds and then they made some out of steel because the aluminum got so expensive. And then YN did the manifold with the plenum on top of it and it was about three mile an hour faster than this manifold. So of course we all went to that immediately. All right, so that, what is your one single fondest memory about this car? Oh, winning Indy. That was the first That's pro it. stock at Indy. It just don't get any better than that. Yeah, I tell these kids, that, that I said, y'all don't know what a high is. A high is when you put this car in fourth gear, you look out the window and you're in front. That's <laughs> a high. That, that's when you get a high. That's but, great. All right, so tell me, once you're strapped in, you're getting ready to go, it's time to race. When do you start thinking about your reaction. Are you thinking about that as you're rolling up? Are you thinking about that as soon as you get in your car? Because that's really the key, is your reaction time. When It's, it's kind of weird, but when we got in these cars and shut the door and buckled the belts, it, everything was just rhythm. I mean, you made the burnout, you hit the tires, you staged, and back then you ran a full tree in pro stock. Right. The best way I know to describe it is people who thought about it screwed up most of the time. So you really didn't think about no. it? No. It was just all part of the rhythm. It was, it was just, just the last reaction. step in the entire checklist. Yep. I mean, you just did it. I used to love to see a guy sitting next to me over there playing with a shifter or something. We never did that. Yeah. I mean, if you had to think about what you were doing, you were going to screw up most of the time. Yeah. It was just simply reaction. Yeah. And we raced, you know, three days a week. Sometimes I've raced, I raced five races in four days one time. <laughs> two at the same day, you know, one afternoon, one night race. Yeah. So you did it so much, that was an advantage that I always felt like that we had because we made so many runs in the car. And you'd go to some track and run a local guy in a match race, that's the first time he'd run his car in a month. And, you know, we'd done run twice that week somewhere else yeah. and made, you know, half a dozen runs. Plus, I was fortunate enough to get to go to Milan and test at Milan a lot with Mr. Hoover and Mr. Mm -hmm. Coddington and that bunch. We'd make three runs, change something, make three runs, change something, make three more runs. Practice makes perfect, right? Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. that, that was our thing, is we got to make so many runs in the cars that other people didn't get to, and I always felt like that was a big part of it. What is it about this livery and the Sox and Martin brand that remains so timeless? I mean, here we're talking 40 plus years later, and this is just as recognizable today as it was back then. Why is this such a special livery and special team? Well, the Sox and Martin team was unquestionably the number one team in the country. They had full factory back and they had the clinic programs and their cars were so good back then. We didn't have anything that other people didn't have. We just prepared everything better. I really believe that's a good part of it. Because yep. when we mashed the clutch down, the engine didn't move forward, the firewall didn't move back, 
Everything stayed where it was supposed to. Everything was mounted solid. And we didn't break stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to describe it, yeah. I guess. So you were driving it properly. Yeah. And well, man, I'm so stoked to see this back on its feet. And it's, it's, a, it's a perfect replica of the car you drove. Is that right? Yes. Absolutely down to the to the end. Yeah, you know what? Let's, let's fire it up. there that's the gearhead mating call the people who never did this have no idea the feeling you get to do that yeah I get choked up talking about it I mean I love it I've done this my whole life so cool Herb thank you, you Chris for coming it's my by. pleasure to know you dude you gotta you gotta come to Burlington uh, I'll, it's on my list spending time with old friends is a big part of these shows for her but there's something else he really looks forward to Herb loves making new friends, diving right in and talking about cars just like their old friends. Welcome, Welcome to the 2019, 2019 Chrysler, Chrysler Nationals. Nationals. Make sure you come down Saturday at 1030 and check out the Herb McCandless Seminar. Mr. Four Speed will be doing a Q&A down in the seminar tent Saturday 1030 with Herb McCandless. Now when we had the business, we'd have a booth set up. But then once I got out of the business, I wasn't going to quit. And so I talked to Lisa that was running this thing. She was talking about doing some seminars. I said, well, let me do one. And so that's how it started. And I've been doing them ever since. And that was at least 15 years ago. They don't book a seminar after mine because I ain't never finished on time. <laughs> Him and his wife, Marie McCandless, built one of the most successful Chrysler parts businesses in the country. And to this day, obviously 22 years later, he still has a great following. From Burlington, North Carolina, Give it up for Herb McCandless. Thank you all. That means a lot. It really does. To me, it does. Uh, who are some of the guys you drove for and they were real experienced, like Heavy? I drove for Heavy. I drove for Billy Stepp. I drove for, of course, Buddy and Ronnie. Uh, I drove for Landy. And I actually drove a Ford for Jack Rouse for a few months, and I didn't want to move to Detroit. Jack's a great guy, very intelligent man, and I spent a month with him at his house while we built the car. And Jack had wrecked two pro stock cars, and he's afraid he's going to kill himself, so he hired me to drive the thing. They were fast; they were really fast, but their parts weren't the quality of stuff that we had at Chrysler. My '62 Imperial is sitting over here, and Edelbrock has come out with a fuel injection system with fuel rails, just like your new cars have. It comes all assembled. You don't do anything. Oh boy, it's nice. If you're even considering a fuel injection setup, it helped the fuel mileage a little bit, not much. But like I told Smitty, you can't get fuel mileage with a 5,500 pound car if you tow it with a rope. Now, even if you're not putting an Edelbrock system, if you're just doing a throttle body system of somebody's, Edelbrock has a fuel system. Do not take your tank off and go buy some high dollar tank with a pump in it and run all these lines under your car. They got 50 pounds of pressure all everywhere. Don't do that. Edelbrock's got this little system. Now, when you look at mine on my Imperial, it's big, but that was the first one they built. And Edelbrock's got one now. It's about this big. You can mount it anywhere up front in the car. You run your stock fuel line from your stock fuel pump to it. It feeds the system. It's got a reservoir and a pressure system in it. There's no return lines, there's nothing. It works great. That one's been on there for six years. I haven't had one second's trouble out of it. What's wrong? Am I getting kicked out? Oh, okay. <laughs> getting kicked out. Thank you all very much. At Carlisle in 2019, Herb runs into one of his best friends from Chrysler's engineering race group. This is my good friend, Mr. Tom Cottington. He was part of the Ram Chargers group. He was part of the race group at Chrysler. He worked with the Motown missile car. He was pretty well in charge of building the chassis and the car in the Motown missile car. And let him tell you a little bit about what his job was at Chrysler because people like him made people like me look good. 
<laughs> it wasn't a hard job. He was good <laughs> to begin with. But we had NASCAR and drag racing. And I worked for Tom Hoover, which was the head of racing, doing the drag racing stuff and the development. We would go from dynamometer to racetrack, and dynamometer never told us the whole story. It would give us a clue what we should try on the car, and then Herb would They'd try it in the car and we'd find out if it worked, you know, with engine, transmission, a little bit of suspension, although I didn't get into much of that. Mine was mostly power train, so. What about carburetors? Well, there's a little story about the carburetors you ran off with. <laughs> <laughs> we were testing Milan Dragway. We usually run it about one to two days a week. And uh, our carburetor expert, John Bauman, had some sweetheart carburetors that he wanted to test. So he gave them to Herb to try. <laughs> Herb fell in love with him. Next thing we know, Herb's on the truck going down the road, and John's chasing him. He wants the carburetor back, right? I throw the window down. I said, they're on the car. Bill Nuss said, just like them. I throw the window up and left. <laughs> we had fun, and we had good times. And it was a challenging thing, and we, we learned a lot about data acquisition. We actually got help from the Huntsville people that were the Chrysler's rocket people. And we had a really expensive recorder before we had telemetry. And we recorded all the data off the car so then we could go back and analyze it and do it scientifically. Sometimes the seat of the pants would tell you one thing and it would tell you something different. You had to learn what to believe. Yeah. And the thing about doing the test is you had to be able to make three runs and run the same number. And I was lucky I could do that. <laughs> Herb was a good test driver, though. He was a very reliable test driver. A lot of drivers would not try to be consistent. They'd try to keep improving their own driving skills. We wanted a reliable test, drive it the same way every time. So we knew it's the engine or the carburetor that's doing it, not the driver. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've got a sheet hanging in the museum. You might have saw it. I think we made 28 runs one day doing the W2 intake manifold for Holland. Yeah. In one day with a four speed race car. He's the only one that could do that, I think. <laughs> really? Really. And he was consistent, so we learned a lot with her. Yeah. Yeah. And what was so neat to me was getting to work with these guys. I mean, I hardly got out of high school, but I could just drive a four speed. And these guys were geniuses. You know, they built the Roadrunners, the Super Bees, the Hemis, the six pack, 446 pack. They did all that. That's what the kids were interested in. Maybe on the street, but. I mean, when we had some really hot cars, Woodward Avenue was a racetrack. In fact. <laughs> Absolutely. That is my pleasure. Believe me, it is my pleasure. stage area here in just a few more minutes we're gonna have a little presentation for Herb McCandless got so many cool cars sitting on the show field including these from the uh, McCandless collection let's see if we can bring some up here to the stage and do a little bit of something with them and that's exactly what we're gonna do here in just a few moments we're happy to have uh, Herb McCandless here along with his son Mike and we'll do some proper introductions of both our guests and the cars here in just a moment Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a Chrysler 300, but it's not just any Chrysler 300. It's VIN number one, the very first ever Chrysler 300 produced. And then this is the, uh, the, the replica of the 1970 Sox and Martin Duster, and they'll talk a little bit more about that. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike McCandless. Hey, thank you guys, appreciate it. Uh, this car, VIN number one, first ever Chrysler 300 built. They built VIN number one and VIN number two about six weeks before they built VIN number three. That was done to get the cars ready for Daytona in February of 55. This car was raced by Vicki Wood in the women's time trial event. And you gotta think about that statement, the women's time trial events. Uh, they were not allowed to be in the pits, would have to come down from the grandstands, get in the car. She goes, sets the world on fire, wins the race, goes back up to the grandstands. Kind of crazy to think about. In the men's race, Brewster Shaw, the actual owner of the car, uh, goes and he ends up second in the men's time trial. Vicki, not being happy just with going out and running in the women's event, jumps into the men's event 
in and gets third. So the Chrysler 300s, even though there were only two of them at the time, finished first, second, and third. At this point in particular, she's 100 years old. She's still alive. She's in Michigan, sharp as a tack. Very honored to have this car. Very excited to preserve uh, the history. And I'll, I'll pop the door open uh, here when I get off. And you can see the VIN tag still on there as a 1001. There were three major match race cars, Nicholson, in the Ford, Jenkins in the Chevy, and Ronnie in the Plymouth. So if Nicholson and Jenkins ran each other, Ronnie didn't have any word race. So Crosser agreed to let Buddy put a second car together, and Buddy picked me, thank goodness, to drive the car, and hired me in May of 70, so that way we'd have four cars and we could all keep racing two or three days a week. Well, one thing people don't realize, you were 26. Yeah in 1970 when you got this car and then going back to getting your first factory Hemi car at 21. Yeah, in 64. I was 21 when I got the factory Hemi car. I'll get away from here because you get me started talking, boy, I can go for a while. <laughs> so if you've got any questions about anything about these cars or if you've got a question about something you're doing to your car or thinking about doing to your car, please talk to me about it. I don't work for anybody and I don't sell anything, but I can point you in the right direction. And so many people, all they want to do is point your wallet in the right direction. I don't care about your wallet. I want to help you with your cars. I love it. Thank you. Herb and Mike McCandless, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't think Herb could have said it any better right there. He wants to help you. So if you want to come down and talk to him about the Sox and Martin team, about the race car, come on down and thank you for being part of this wonderful afternoon. There are surprises around every corner at these car shows, like the collector who ended up with Herb's 67 RO car, one of only 17 four-speeds ever made. How did you end up finding the car? Like, what's the, the background for well, it? Now, this is back in 99, 2000, right. and I found an ad on the internet uh, for an RO car in, in Southern Virginia. Right. Got a hold of a guy, went, went, went and got it, and uh, brought it home, and I, I, I saw that this car had all those layers of paint on it and it looked like somebody's old race car. Right. And I said, I better not touch this car until I find out who used to race it. Right. And then 20 years went by. <laughs> right, right. Well, thank goodness, because I mean, that's what ended up getting us together. Yes. And now, Doug, you didn't have the 67 car that long. You got the car in around June, right, of 67? May or June. I actually had it into early 68s when I sold the car. Okay. And they put an automatic in it because couldn't nobody drive the four speeds back then. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, that and, was part of what allowed him and I to start connecting stuff together on the cars. But, mm -hmm. And then the story that a lot of people don't know is about the your car becoming a GTX. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So well, <laughs> why are you turning red, Dad? <laughs> if you had a GTX with a Hemi in it, you ran super stock E instead of D because it was heavy enough. Well. I won't go to jail now, will I? No, no. Statue <laughs> of A friend of mine worked at the Dodge dealership, and this guy came in there, was trading in a 67 GTX. And he's in the office in there making the deal. And the VIN plate fell off his car out in the parking lot, and, and we picked it up and carried it home and put it on my, my RO car. <laughs> it went through NHRA, and they still kicked me out because we left the hood scoop on it. Cool. So, but here's the great part about that story is that when he, I had not told Eric about that. And so when I'm there to look over the car, one of the points that comes up is the VIN tag is not put on with the factory rivets. And for a lot of people, that would be a flag that would say, man, I'm not so sure about this. Mm -hmm. But then I told him, well, actually, Dad re-riveted the tag <laughs> back on. Which, so this is actually further proof that the car is actually right. And we have pictures of you racing the car as a GTX with the yep. white interior and everything yep. like that. Maybe, that is that how I should restore it? Should I put no. it with the white <laughs> GTX interior? Somebody might want to find a VIN, Jay. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to thank you, Eric. Thanks so much, because man, if you hey, hadn't thanks. preserved all that stuff, there's no way I'd have it. And then without that, we wouldn't be able to share it and be able I to tell this I think this couldn't have been story. any better to go back to you. And... Along with all his other memories, Marie is never far from Herb's mind. And every chance he gets, he makes sure something positive can come from his family's loss. So get, your, get your physical every year. If you were ever dumb enough to be a smoker, when you go get a physical, tell the doctor, don't ask the doctor, tell the doctor you want a chest x-ray. And they'll tell you that we don't give chest x-rays when we do physicals. So I didn't ask you if you give it, I want one. Because lung cancer has no symptoms whatsoever. You don't know you've got it till it spreads, and it's too late then. I lost Marie three years ago to that. So just make them give you the, the x-ray and check it, and do it 
if you were a smoker, do it every year because you will not know you've got it till it's too late. Yes, sir. Back at the round table, the group talks about the unique era they came up in, an era that they were so privileged to make their this mark on. the first on. time we've been together in several years, all of us. We all thank the world of each other and we do anything for each other and, and it's just great to get to sit around with everybody and talk. And, and we grew up in job. The, we grew up in the best time this country's ever had for what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We absolutely did. You can't do today what we did back then mm -hmm. and, and make a living at it and gain the notoriety and, and then turn it into a, a business and and just basically enjoy your life. I'm seventy five years old and I've enjoyed every day of my life. I mean I I quit my job in 68, and this is what I've done since then. Well, it's like I've told these guys, Ronnie and I talked about it quite a few times before he passed away. It, you know, it'd be great to be 25 again today and the TV coverage and the money that's out there and everything else, but wouldn't take anything in the world for the era that we came mm -hmm. through. Because the, uh, like Herb said, the racers today just, they just, they don't, know what summer duck is they don't know what being up you know from thursday morning to monday morning and all the the different things that you go through and it's uh it's just a, it's a different world but yeah and then they have it. these nostalgia races and they don't do it right they they do it with a christmas tree and they they don't put down rosin and right. they don't do all the things you know we used to do and that's not the way we used to race. I mean, well, they run 20 races a year, major yeah. events. They don't go to all the different places that we went to. Mm -hmm. Like right. Buddy said, they've never been to Summer Duck or mm -hmm. any of those places like that. Right. Uh, Aquasco, Capitol, yeah. right. some of those tracks <laughs> like that that we go to on Saturday night in a place would be so crowded you couldn't even get walk around in the place. Yeah, right. North Wilsboro and Dunn Benson and yeah. Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. God. Hey, I went to George Ray's Wildcat Hot Rod Red Ship. Ah, Paragold, Arkansas, back out. <laughs> Paragold, Arkansas. I set a car on fire there once. <laughs> Were you there when they did that? I did that. That was my There you go. There you go. Well, and as always, I'm humbled to be able yeah. to sit with you guys. I see myself as a historian, but you guys made the history, and uh, it's been wonderful to always sit in and find out the things that people that haven't heard before. So thank you so much for all your recall about all that stuff as well. Yeah, but the thing of it is, it wouldn't be noble history if we didn't yeah. have guys like yourself right. well, that made it known. When you're looking at uh, people who are racing today, what's the biggest difference between? The biggest difference that I see between today's racing and what we did, uh, like Buddy was saying yesterday, we never roped the cars off. The people could walk right up and talk to us. Today's racers, they don't mingle with the crowd, so to speak. They're always closed up in their hauler and their taped off areas and stuff like that. Do you see yourself as a problem solver? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm proud of that. I really am. I mean, I don't know. I've, we've just always figured out ways to do things when we didn't necessarily have what it took to do it or the resources to do it, but we always got it done. I mean, we didn't think anything about it. We just got it done. I mean, first time I ever broke a rear end, I just took it apart. I didn't know what was in there. I exploded a transmission in my 60 Chevy one time. I mean, there was nothing left in it. I'd never seen the inside of one of them. I took it home, took it apart, laid all the pieces out, went up town, bought me some pieces just like it, and put it back together, and it was fine. You didn't have any training for that? You didn't? No, you just figure it out. You just figure it out. I, I had a guy call me one day, he taking the clutch pedal out of his car, and he called me and he said, Herb, how do you get that spring back on there? They had a huge spring that went on the pedal. And he said, I've been trying for two hours to put that spring on the car. He said, how do you do that? I said, well, you take it over and stick it in the vise. You bend it over sideways and stuff some washers in it. You bend it the other way and stuff some washers in it. And when you get enough washers in it that's long enough, you hang it up on there and pull the washers out. And he called me back in about 15 minutes. And he said, how did you figure that out? I said, I don't know. We just figured it out. What, what's your favorite color? I like a red car, and I like a pearl white car. I like the brighter colors, the stuff that stands out. See, I grew up in the Chrysler era where you had sassy grass green and plum crazy purple and uh, limelight green and Moulin Rouge pink and Panther pink. And, and uh, those, car, those cars were neat. When you saw one of those cars, you looked at it. You absolutely looked at it. You know, Chrysler painted those things pink, and you know, when you saw one of those cars, it just was stunning. 
How long have you been wearing cowboy boots? Wow, I got married in them in 1968. <laughs> 66, I mean. I've been wearing boots since I was real young. I don't have, I do not own a pair of dress shoes. And I haven't in 50 or 60 years. Can you tell me about the tools you have in your workshop? Or... Can you name it? <laughs> uh, I've got a really, really well equipped shop. And I've taken, you know, 50 years to accumulate all this stuff. It's not like I went out one day and got all of it. Uh, I've got a shear, I got a metal brake, got an English wheel, I got a shrinker, stretcher, two different brakes, and got a coal saw, got a bridge port, two different band saws, and a three different band saws. Got three different welders. Uh, What's your favorite tool in that workshop to work with? My Heli Arc welder. I love to weld. <laughs> I, and I like to weld little stuff. I don't want to weld a quarter inch plate. Anybody can do that. Uh, I like to make things out of sheet metal. I, I use a lot of, uh, that's roughly about 45,000 thick to make panels and to make pieces go under the dash, just all kind of stuff. I just finished the deal that goes on the dash. It's got the air conditioner vents in it. It's got a clock in it. It's got a bolt gauge in it, and, and uh, it fits right up on the dash. And I will really enjoy making stuff like that. And then you put it in, and it looks like it belongs. It doesn't look like some add-on thing. I hate something that's stuck up that just kind of looks like it was added on. Yeah, every day you went to work, these were long days, and why? Oh, we didn't work. We played. We raced for a living. We, I mean, we worked seven days a week. We didn't, I mean, you didn't think anything about building a car and climbing in there and welding bars and building sheet metal and putting fender wells in and cutting the car up and stuff like that. That wasn't work. That was just what you did that day. And, and you thought about it all night. And the next day you had a plan when you got there what you were going to do that day. And, and the same way with these cars that we fool with now. I'm down at my building every morning by 8.30, 9 o'clock. I mean, I get up and that's where I go. I'm down there and I'm there till 5 or 6 o'clock and sometimes a lot later than that. Because if I get to doing something, I don't want to quit until I get it done. If I'm fabricating something or making something, I'm just going to keep right on work until I get it done. And, and that's what I like to do. What about the sound of a race car? When you get to the drag strip and you hear the cars, what does that sound like to you? What does that feel like? When you crank the Hemi in the pits, Everything else was drowned out. I mean, that engine just had a sound of its own. And that was just the greatest sound in the world. I mean, it, I'd get in that 72 car and buckle myself in and hit the button, and that thing would light up, and you just felt good. I mean, that, that's the only way to describe it. You push the clutch in, pull that thing up in the water, and put the car in third gear and come out in the water smoking the tires. There was, there was nothing like that. There's no feeling like winning. There's no feeling like winning. It really isn't. I don't care what you do in life, nothing feels any better than the feeling we had back in those days driving those cars and going to a race and winning. And especially when you're just getting started and you're able to go out there and compete with the, the big boys, so to speak, and outrun them. And I mean, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it. That's why I think we worked as hard as we did and at the pace we went at, because we knew it, we were going to the racetrack and, and at the end of the day, you were just going to be fantastic. When I got in that car and buckled the belts up and pushed the clutch in, you were just in a world of your own. That was what was so neat. When you closed that door, you were in a world of your own. Uh, I had somebody say something to me about they were standing beside the track and they waved at me as I was going to the start line. I didn't see them. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't pay attention to the crowd. You don't pay attention to anything. How do you want to be remembered when we're all looking back on this, you know, 50 years from now, your great grandkids are, are hearing stories about you. What, what do you want them to say? Well, I like for people to remember how I raced, what I did, how hard I worked, and how much I helped people. That means more to me than you can imagine. I love to help people. Uh, I really enjoy helping somebody with a car, tell them how to do it, and showing them the right way to do things. I don't take shortcuts. I don't mess stuff up and, and try to do it some cheap way or something. People who save a dollar doing something spend $10 to fix it. There's never enough money to do it right the first time, but there's always money to fix it with. But I just want people to remember how much I did to help this industry.
I found a mirror that Dakota Digital makes. It's got a compass and outside temperature gauge in it. And I love to put those on the cars. And I just put a mirror in a 59 Dodge Coronet last week. It's got a backup camera in the mirror. You put it in reverse and the backup camera lights up in the mirror. You don't see it on a 59 Dodge, but I, I'm a wiring nut. I, I love to wire stuff. You open the door on uh, several of the cars that I've done, and it's got a little light in the door. It shines down on the ground and it puts a circle out about 18 inches in diameter. It's got a great big M in it for Mopar. And I'll pull in a parking lot at night and open the door and people go nuts. I'm here, wow, look at that. 